So you know, equilibrium is the focus of the entire rest of the first semester. Even to some extent, kinetics that we've talked about is really building us up to the idea of equilibrium. So this is really, really important moving forward. We're going to relate for the rest of this first semester. We're going to relate, um, you know, KSP to equilibrium. We're going to talk about reactions to equilibrium. We're going to talk about energy and equilibrium. We're going to talk about electrochemistry and equilibrium. So equilibrium really is the biggest idea that we're going to talk about this year. So it's an, it's really important that you have a good understanding as we move forward. Okay, so you should be able to write and solve Ka, Ksp, Kb, and Keq expressions. And you should be able to predict the change in equilibrium based on experimental conditions. Okay, so equilibrium is the process in which the forward rate and the backward rate of a reaction are equal. So if I have a reaction that's like A plus B goes to C, you also have the backward reaction of C going to A plus B. Equilibrium is the point where the rate at which you form C and the rate at which you form A and B are equal. And you see that represented by the graph. The graph of rate and time, which you should f be familiar with the rate and time graphs from uh, kinetics, come to a point where they equal out. That is the point at which equilibrium occurs. Equilibrium also means that there is no changing amount of the substance. If you look, my amount of C is equal to the amount of A and the amount of B that I have. Now notice the values don't have to be the same. So I can have 1 A and 1 B and 10 C. But what happens is there is no more change in the amount of A and B I have, and there is no more change in the amount of C that I have. So, as a review from kinetics, which we just finished, you have this idea that you have a rate. And the only difference between this and what we've talked about before is the addition of this little F right here. Now, this means the forward reaction. So it's the idea that you have a rate in which you have the forward reaction gives you this rate law. Now we're assuming that this rate law came from experimental data, but you have kinetics, you can write a rate law for the forward reaction. Well, just like you have the forward reaction, you also have the backward reaction. In this case, we call it KR, or the reverse reaction. Now, we have a rate here, and we have a rate here. Now remember, equilibrium is the concept that the rates are equal. So I don't know what the rate is. The rate could be 10, it could be 5, it could be 150,000. But this rate is equal to this rate. Whoops. Is equal to this rate. Just like when you have any two things that are equal, you can set them equal to one another. So when the rate forward equals the, the rate reverse, which is the very definition of equilibrium, you can set them equal to one another. When you do, you get Kf, N2O2 squared, Kr, N2O4, and it equals rate. So the rate terms are gone. Now what you can do is you can rearrange this expression. And when you rearrange this expression, you want to get your, your rates on the same side. And that's what I did here. I took both sides, I divided both sides by Kr, and when I have that, I have Kr, Kf divided by Kr. And in order to do that, I'm trying to isolate this KF term, or this K term, excuse me. And so what I do is I divide both sides by N2, O2 squared. And this is my expression that I get right here. I get KF divided by KR equals N2, O4 divided by N2, O2 squared. Now, whenever we have this idea, this fact, the forward reaction and the backwards reaction, those, those rate of reaction constants, when you divide them together, is equal to what we call capital K. So a lowercase k divided by a lowercase k equals a capital K. Now this k is what we call the equilibrium constant. 
And it is the same thing that we've talked about before with Ksp and Ka and all those Ks. It is the idea of the equilibrium constant. It is the ratio of the two um, kinetic rate constants when equilibrium is established. So you should be able to recognize equilibrium from a graph. Right here, when you have equal rates, or right here, when you have no changing in the amount of substances. It is really important that you look at your axes to see what you're looking at. Because you could have some sort of trick where they say, if this says rate, the only place that equilibrium would be would be there. Equilibrium is the point at which the rates are equal, not necessarily the amounts. So you should also be able to recognize equilibrium from the data. If you look right here, you're looking for a place where the concentration stays constant. And this is what you're looking for. And some people say, well, that's not constant. It actually went back up. When you have very small variations, where it goes down, 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 and then all of a sudden it goes up one, that's going to be some sort of instrumental error. You have to be able to look forward and say, is this really 0.5 or is it really 0.51? And you need to be able to look for those sorts of patterns. But if you look, it consistently went down, 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 less down, and then all of a sudden it went up, this is going to be your point where equilibrium is established. It's going to happen somewhere around five seconds, between four and five seconds. So now you should be able to write an equilibrium expression. So the equilibrium expression is the ratio at equilibrium. So you know how we said before that you could not determine the lowercase k value or the rate law or anything like that from a balanced chemical equation. That goes out the window, okay? It goes out the window because if you have a balanced chemical equation, it will allow you to write the equilibrium expression. So, it is always a ratio of the products divided by the reactants. So in this case, if I have A, B, and C, I could write the concentration of C because that is a product divided by the concentration of the reactants. And if you notice, I wrote two A's. The reason why I wrote two A's is because I have two A's. You multiply all of those things together. So in other words, this simplifies to C divided by A squared B, which is the same thing that we have here. I've got two A's squared B and C. Now, you can write an equilibrium expression even if something is not at equilibrium. If it is not at equilibrium, it is given a special value and it is called Q. Q is just saying it's an equilibrium expression that has not reached equilibrium yet. It will still move towards equilibrium, but that's why it's given a special variable Q. If you are given a K value, that is the equilibrium value, so equilibrium has been established. So the general equation you have for K. K is equal to C to the C, D to the D, divided by A to the A, B to the B. Okay. Nothing changes once you've established equilibrium. Now here's one real key point that, that goes through all of the rest of what we're talking about. Only gases and aqueous substances are involved in equilibrium expressions. The reason being is solids and liquids are uniform in their composition and you cannot change the concentration of them. If you have a solid, you cannot compress the solid so it takes up more or less space. If you have a liquid, you cannot compress a liquid for it to take up more or less space. So because of that, these values, the concentration of A, concentration of B, if you're talking about a solid and a liquid, they never change. But if you have a gas, a gas that takes up this much space can be expanded to take up a larger amount of space. So because of that, you can change the concentration of a gas. You can also change the, the concentration of an aqueous substance, something that's dissolved in something else. That is why those substances are included in an equilibrium expression. We talked about KSP earlier this year. KSP represents a very specific case of equilibrium. It's the idea that you have the solubility product equilibrium. It follows the exact same form as the general equation, but instead its reactant is solid, so it's not included. So an example of that is if you have the, the disassociation of salt. So my equation is NaCl which is a solid, is allowed to go into water, and it becomes Na plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. Because of that, 
you can write the expression KSP. The reason why it's called SP is it's because it's telling me how much solid will dissolve. The solubility product. So how much solid will dissolve is equal to the concentration of Na plus times the concentration of Cl minus. Okay, at that point you should be able to solve it, but it's the same basic thing that we have for any sort of K expression. I did not include NaCl because it was a solid, and solids have no part of an equilibrium expression. So it says, write an equilibrium expression for the dissolution of sodium chloride. We just did that, so we don't have to worry about that. It says, what is the equilibrium constant when a system at equilibrium contains 2.4 atoms of nitrogen, 1.6 atoms of hydrogen, and 8 atmospheres of ammonia? Okay, so what you have to do at this point is you need to be able to write a balanced chemical equation. You should be able to recognize nitrogen as a Brinkelhoff. You should be able to represent hydrogen as a Brinkelhoff. And you should know that ammonia is NH3. With just that information, you should be able to write a balanced chemical equation. So I would write N2 plus H2 goes to NH3. So I know right away that I'm going to have at least two ammonias, which means I'm going to have three hydrogens. Now that I have my balanced chemical equation, I can recognize that all of these are gases. If I didn't know that, I'm given the atmospheres or pressure of all these. So I know that they're all gases. At that point, I know all of these are going to go in my equilibrium expression. My equilibrium expression would be P of N2 and then P of H2, and then P of NH3. Now you may be saying, where did the P come from? Anytime you're giving it an equilibrium expression in terms of gases, a lot of times instead of representing it as this, you will see it represented this way, where it's represented as the pressure of nitrogen, and the pressure of hydrogen, and the pressure of ammonia. That lets somebody who's looking at this know that they're talking about a gas. And concentration of a gas doesn't really make a whole lot of sense anyway. Now if you notice, I didn't actually write this equilibrium expression correctly. I wrote it as PN2, which is correct. I wrote it as PH2, but it really should be PH2 cubed, because I have this number 3 here for H2. And it should be PNH3 squared, because I have this right here. And even then I didn't write it correctly. And the reason why I didn't write it correctly is because you should know that it's supposed to be products divided by reactants. So it should actually be P2 and H3 divided by PN2 pH2 cubed. At that point, you can now plug your values in. You plug in your value for nitrogen. My value for nitrogen is 2.4. Okay, I plug in my value for hydrogen, which is 1.6. But remember, that 1.6 number is now cubed. And then I would plug in the number for nitrogen or for ammonia, which was 8, and 8 is squared. So you'd have this idea of it's 8 squared divided by 2.4 divided by 1.6 cubed, and that would be your final answer. Next, it says, uh, what is the equilibrium constant based on the data below? So when you're looking for the equilibrium constant, you first have to be able to recognize what the equilibrium concentrations are. So if you look at the data, equilibrium is clearly established at this point right here. So I know what my concentration of A is at equilibrium. I know my concentration of B at equilibrium, and I know my concentration of C at equilibrium. So we're not going to mess around this time. We're going to do it correctly right off the bat. We're going to say that K is equal to C squared divided by A, B. Then you would plug in, you would say at equilibrium my value is 1.6 squared divided by 1 and 0.5. So you would take the idea of 1.6 squared divided by 0.5 and that would be your equilibrium constant. Okay, if you have an equilibrium constant of 1, what that means is that the products and the reactants are favored equally. So if you have the reaction A plus B goes to C, and you have C divided by AB is 1, 
you're saying you have the same ratio of reactants and products. Now the notice how that doesn't mean it's necessarily the same thing. It just means I have a concentration of 2 for C and then I would have to have a combined total concentration of 2 for these two. It doesn't matter necessarily what those are. It says that neither the reactants or the products are favored but instead they occur in equal amounts. If K is greater than 1 you have more products than reactants. Same thing, if I have A plus B goes to C, the only way that I can get a K bigger than 1 is if my concentration of C is greater than my concentration of A and B. Okay, So that's the only way that you can get a K value of greater than 1. If K is less than 1, that means you have more reactants than products. Once again, A plus B goes to C. So if you have K is equal to C and A and B, you have more A and B than you do C. So you can predict whether or not there's going to be more products or reactants based solely on the K value. The equilibrium expression can allow you to predict how much of each you're going to have. Then we come to what's called Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle is really important in terms of multiple choice questions. In fact, you tend to see at least three to four of these on every AP exam. And it's the idea that if you have a system at equilibrium and you disturb that system, so let's say, for example, I have A plus B and it's now in equilibrium with C. So I've established some sort of equilibrium and I disturb that equilibrium. You can disturb equilibrium a lot of ways. One way is to all of a sudden add more C. If I were to add more C, I've disturbed my balance, my equilibrium point. So what will happen is you will either get more of the forward reaction or more of the backward reaction in order to re-establish equilibrium. So Le Chatelier's principle just says a system that's disturbed will re-establish equilibrium somehow. So the first way, like we talked about, is changing concentrations. If you increase or decrease the concentrations, it disturbs equilibrium and the system will shift to re-establish equilibrium. Okay, say, say for example, we have A going to B. It's a very, very simple one. They're at equilibrium. All of a sudden, I add more A, which makes this thing go down. What will happen is I will make more B to reduce the amount of A that I have so that now I will have my balance point again. I'll get to the point where A and B are balanced again. Okay, another way is that you can change the pressure. Changing the pressure only works for systems that are gases. If you have a system in which, um, if you have a system that's concentration, changing the pressure won't affect it at all because you're talking about the concentration of a solid in a liquid. It just doesn't work. Now, whenever you change the volume, is how you change the pressure a lot of times. So you need to be aware of the fact that by increasing the volume, you are decreasing the pressure. Remember, pressure is in the K expression for gases, something like, like that. So if you were to all of a sudden change the pressure or change the volume, it's going to affect these. And some of you may say, well, if it's going to affect both of them equally. That is not always the case. Now, one thing that you do need to realize is that whenever you add an inert gas, something like argon, okay, it has nothing to do with the reaction itself. That's not going to influence either one of these pressures. You're talking about the partial pressure of B and the partial pressure of A. So adding an inert gas has no impact on the reaction. Changing the temperature. Whenever you change the temperature, um, you're changing the amount of available energy. Because of that, you have to say that it will influence equilibrium. In order for you to do this, you have to realize that most reactions are either endothermic or exothermic. So for example, an endothermic reaction is one where energy is a reactant. So it's something like energy plus A plus B goes to C. If you have this particular reaction, if you were to suddenly increase the temperature, you're increasing the amount of available energy. If you increase the amount of available energy, you've disturbed equilibrium. So what will happen is the reaction will go this way to lower this value. In other words, energy is treated almost the same as you would with concentration or something else. Likewise, if you were to lower the temperature, C 
would fall apart in order to produce more energy and reestablish equilibrium. So, you should be able to predict what's going on. Now, a catalyst has no effect on equilibrium concentrations because what it does is it lowers the energy of activation for both reactions. For example, here is my A plus B, here is my C. Whenever you reach equilibrium, the AB has its energy of activation, the C going to A and B has its equilibrium. Whenever you change the energy of activation point, you lower it for both reactants. Whether it's the product or whether it's C going to A and B or A B going to C, it lowers it for both of them. So the result is there is no change. Alright, so it says nitrogen and hydrogen gas is mixed to form ammonia gas with 92.6 kilo kilojoules uh, kilojoules per mole released per reaction. This is the system reaches equilibrium. How would the concentration change if? So, once again, we have this N2 plus H2. And this is a pretty common reaction that you see on the AP test because this is how we make fertilizer. So you see three, it's called the Born-Haber process. So this is our reaction, and then it says it releases. Releases means that energy is produced. So here's my energy. The first thing that it says is it says that the temperature is increased. If the temperature is increased, okay, I've disturbed equilibrium. In other words, I now have more of these things, and I need to make less of them. How I make less of them is I shift this to the left, and I would make more N2 and H2. Now, if the volume of the container is suddenly decreased, if I am decreasing the volume, then I am increasing the pressure. So if you look at this, I have pressure of N2, well, hold on, let's write it the correct way, pressure of NH3 squared, and then I have pressure of N2 and pressure of H2. Whenever you do this, whenever you increase the pressure, you are trying to decrease the pressure as a result. In other words, increasing the pressure disturbs equilibrium. In order to fight that, you are going to go in the direction that produces less gas molecules. On this side, oh, let me change colors. On this side, you have four gas molecules all contributing to the pressure. On this side, you only have two gas molecules contributing to the pressure. So as a result, if you if you decrease the volume of the container, you will shift equilibrium to make more ammonia so that there is less gas and you decrease the pressure overall. Last one says argon is added to the mixture, has no effect. Argon is an inert gas and will have no effect whatsoever. All right, so we will go over more equilibrium in class, but it is really a really, really important concept for you to understand moving forward.